everybody, and all. welcome back to an exciting episode of Indie Corner Radio. I'm your host, Jonathan Moody, and uh, we've got a the mid-season finale here. And, of course, our mid-season uh, finale guest is Bradley Stryker. How are you doing, Bradley? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so excited. I've been, I think we've been trying to do this for like, I don't know how long. And then just things just keep happening, you know? And uh, then you're just like, hey, let's do it, you know, these times. And I'm like, let's, let's do it. Let's get this, let's get this over with, you know, not <laughs> over with like that. But... Let the punishment be done with that. <laughs> no, that's what it's the way. I work better that way, man. I'm completely always spontaneous. I'm not very good at like, I schedule so like when I schedule something, it just basically means that I'm going to get a job that's going to put me to work that day. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a little scared because I'm talking to Sheriff uh, Wilkins, you know, from uh, yes, you Devil are. in Ohio, and uh, when I saw you, I was, a little, you know, like in the show, you know, you're <laughs> sure. <laughs> you're sure. a little intimidating, to be honest, <laughs> you know. Or what well, did you say? It's funny you say that because the. Uh, you know, uh, the, the character specifically had some um, had some traits, if you will, that I uh, had to had to quickly figure out. And one of them was that he everybody inside of the cult was like minded in the way we thought and the way that the short story is constructed. I don't know how, you know, how much research you ever did on it, but it's a true story. Right. Those people had done a very good job of isolating themselves because they had the financial resources to create a county and the whole thing. So then they had one sheriff in that county that basically scared everybody from driving through that county. So nobody did. But he was also the only conduit to the outside world. Right. So Because he's the he only one who like leaves, right? You know, correct. And so when I would leave, the reason you saw such stillness and like, uh, I mean, the darkness was just because of the way I, the guy thinks, but the way he was always so still in things is because he was very calculated, but he also thought at all times that he was talking to somebody that was like an infidel because <laughs> everybody outside of the way that we thought is completely lost. Right. Like and you so, have to be in the group to under like, yeah, I totally get that. So yeah. you're talking to like Emily Desch now, which I mean, that's just period. Yeah. being in a scene with her. I'm sure was Pretty, pretty amazing period yeah. where the uh, police officer, uh, Alex, when you're like with those two guys, like period, most of the time, it's just like, I mean, th I felt like that dynamic there, you know? Well, he's also, he's always calculating and looking for the one upsmanship and he loves the game of it all, the chess of it all. Right. Um, that's part of his, with all of them, that was part of the game, especially with those two, because they're the two I met, dealt with the most. Um, he just really liked the game of it. So it was sitting there and looking somebody in the eyes, thinking they're beneath you. And then also just going, I know, figuring out what they need and then figuring out how to get what I want still. And then also entertaining them, their ideas and their needs enough that they'll all get what I want before I leave. So it's a game. It was all toying with them. It was almost like leading somebody to the edge of a cliff. And then them just sitting, still wanting something and then to go, oh, by the way, you're standing on loose dirt and just watch them fall off the cliff. Yeah. And then go on my way. He's That's just the way his brain would work, right? Because he thought he was so superior to everybody. Because also just the stuff that these people did was pretty dark. And um, Now, it, I, I didn't finish it. I'm sorry. Like, I didn't get a chance to, like, finish the last two episodes. But um, uh what I what I gathered from what I did see, you know, and everything was that a lot of it had to do with like the idea of a uh, of a girl who escapes something where that she's sort of been born into, like she sort of knows everything, you know, that's all she knows and sort of has to adjust reality. Then your character was your character born into this or was he just sort of picked somehow? I know he, he he was he would have been born into it because we were the actual lineage of the story would have been our ancestors, if not even ancestors, but like a generation or two above us is the ones that actually started it. Hmm. So the, the actual story um, goes back a little ways. But so there's certain people who are in it and some some people, you know, gravitate towards it. Mine would have been a lineage thing that I was. It's always been the way I have thought. Um, whereas when you're born into it, you don't 
if you believe the things these people believe, then it's very finite vision, right? It's just the way that they thought. So everything outside of that was new information. And also beyond new information, it was all um, false beliefs. And it's not just like normal religious beliefs. This is just their, their way of thinking was so specific and dangerous and violent, by the way. You know, one of the things they did in that place is it uh, three years old to prove that you're worthy of being there. They would hang children, toddlers, three-year-olds upside down from a cross, nailed to it, hands and feet for 24 hours. And that's a real thing they did. And so they did it so you could prove your worth. So if you see pictures of the real people, everybody, and I mean everybody, man, woman, child, there's not a possibility that these people smiled. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like life was about pain and anger. And they were taught the, the, the beliefs of the, you know, the devil is their, their guiding light and all this stuff. And the it grantor comes, wishes, as they call them. I mean, and the, the actual story is pretty, pretty crazy because these, the guy who was their leader from generations before killed his brother in front of this community of people who were all starving because they were, they kept buying cheap land when America was being established and not being able to grow anything. So the people were starving and getting diseases and dying. And so in front of the community of people, he killed his brother with a shovel and told everybody that he's been talking to the devil and he figured out what they should do. Took them to Ohio where he found this lush farmland and they became very prosperous and because of all of that, these people thought, oh, obviously this guy knows what he's talking about. He just led us to their promised land. And it became so lucrative for them that they got a government uh, thing for the war. And they sold corn and pork to the U.S. military, became wealthy, hired a lawyer, established their county, which is then comes to our story, correct? Yeah. So after all these generations and all the proof, if you will, that we come from higher thinking, there you go. And so the young woman that does escape is born into it. And she's like, what is this? This is ridiculous. And she right. was just part of it. It's just and a she, she leaves and then whatever, like the character, right? The leaves and yeah. then goes and meets this other family. And I, like, I kind of like that. Like, I liked the idea of like, I, I remember like there's one part where the girl's like, she's so selfish. Everything's about her. And I'm like, the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exactly. I mean, yeah, she she's like it's a very interesting story really because i believe that's also part of the truth of the whole thing right yeah. um and uh if you think about like you know beliefs that you people in your family might have had let's say 100 years ago to flash forward to now they're, they've changed right mm -hmm. but when you're talking about extreme thinking like this if you buy in and nothing changes then it's 100 percent facts right mm -hmm. even if you start to question a tiny bit then it becomes impossible to be part of that community because that community didn't allow you to question anything so even just going do i really have to marry my own dad was too much <laughs> you know right. what I mean? and that's like absurd thinking in the community and so she becomes this person that leaves and so it wasn't like she wanted to go you know go and listen to hip hop music and go to a school dance. She just right. didn't want to marry your dad. <laughs> yeah. Like what yeah. was it? Malachi says to uh, Noah at one point, uh, you know, your, your sister's always been a, like a free thinker, you know, or whatever, always thought for herself, which now that you're saying that, that totally makes sense for, for that, because like she, she thought for herself, nobody else in the, you know, any of the family seems to think for themselves like that, you know, or whatever. Um, I, I love that. I think a lot of finite thinking, a lot of very, you know, tunnel vision, if you will, that different groups of people have come from fears, right? They don't want other groups to take over their job or that comes from different fears, external factors that they don't want to affect their lives. This was totally different. This was a group of people who weren't worried about anyone else. They just knew that they were above everyone else and had figured it out. They were they had money. They weren't worried about somebody coming and taking their their county or anything. They were just more about we're above the rest of you people. You people are infidels. You're little simple peoples. And I found that to be so intriguing because like the um, you know if you do a lot of research on these things, a lot most of the time you, you start to discover discover people that are very sort of finite thinkers. And they can't think outside of that because they're really scared if they do, they'll have to accept other people to be part of the world that they live in. And then they risk things like, you know, like jobs and money and things like that. And that's what terrifies them to thinking like this.
Now, before you auditioned, were you familiar with this story at all? Not at all. Not So at all. that's cool. Um, So I when did. you auditioned, though, did you give the performance that you gave now? Or do you think it was a different performance than than that? No, I think I reason I got the job is that I, I knew that he was the sheriff of the cult. And so my brain was able, able to deduce the one fact that he was probably the only person. Cause I, I knew enough information to know that he was the contact to the outside world. Um, so I made, I, he had to be malleable. He had to be able to walk into a room and be like, hi, a lot of the people in that situation, those people couldn't even look at another person outside of it. Cause they would have been weird. It would have been too weird to them. Right. Mm hmm The world's so small. So he had to be the one that could look somebody in the eyes. Um, what I decided not to do with him, which is why I think maybe the job sort of came my way is I decided not to make him fully a, a normal human being outside. Right. So instead of him being like, Hey man, how are you? He would be more of like, hi, how are you? Yeah, like He's he, still very controlled and calm, but he was also nice. yeah, almost. I mean, not not robotic, but sort of like more stern and more, Which is you more know. plotting, but like also like able to do that. As, but I didn't think that it would be smart to take him as far as to be more like Bradley in the real world, because then the disconnect would be so far from his real world, his real life, that now you're turning him into some sort of like wild chameleon who would probably be running the cult instead of being part of it. Exactly. And I, I like that. I saw your character like you. You were there during like rituals. And so you're just you're there with the cult, helping them out any way they they, they need, you know, because you're the you're the you're the only law enforcement, right? Like you're the, you were it, you know, That's that's it. all they needed was you. In the real story, what they used to do is like if you went speeding through their their county, let's say you were five miles over the speed limit and I pulled you over, we'd throw you in jail for the night. Yeah, like the turn signal or whatever, right? This is your Anything. turn signal. So people just went around it. They're like, don't drive through there. There's this crazy sheriff guy in there who will just arrest you for being inside. And also people, you know, the rumors of what's going on in there exist. So like, do you really want to drive through a place where it's that dark and creepy? So people would just go around it and they wouldn't be bothered. It was a really smart way for them to buy their own privacy because that's what they did. So, okay. Well, we talked a lot about this right now. We'll probably come back to the devil in Ohio, Oh, good, but I, I do want to get into like your, your background. Like, how did you, how did you get started in this business? yeah. Uh, it's 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 a long story, but I can make it short. I was in college, and in college, and when I was at college and university, I went to in the end, I went to six different schools. I finished in four years, uh, just because that's the way I my brain works. I just I, I found a way to do too much all at once, you know. Um, And in that time, I was studying exercise and nutrition, kinesiology, and I discovered that I'm as much as I like that, and I'm an exercise person, and I like the you know to move. I didn't want to spend my life doing that. Uh, that was more of a hobby thing, not a profession that I was going to want to go into. Uh, and so once I crossed off like physical therapy and athletic trainer from that list, were other two sort of disciplines you can do. I was like, what do I want to do? And I ended up going to New York for a summer. And uh, uh, being introduced to the world of like print work and commercials and then acting classes became part of that because they exist there. So I took a couple of these really weird, fun acting classes, which now I've done a million of, but then I didn't have any idea. Right. Uh, and I'm like, this is very intriguing. And I, I was like, I, I think I want to try this. And I was between my junior and senior year. And I called my mom and I said, mom, I'm going to stay in New York. I'm not going back to college. I was in college in San Diego. And she's my mom, very smart. Oh, okay, that's fine. You know, she calls me the next day and goes, Hey, you know, I just wanted to make sure you understood how much you owe for your college loans. <laughs> and it was like, and she started giving me, and I was like, Oh, great. I owe all that money and I got no diploma. So the next day I called her back again. This is, this is all in the course of 48 hours. I called her and I said, Yeah, I'm going to go back. She goes, Oh, really? Oh, okay. If you want, you know, completely manipulating me. Um, so then I, when I went back, I ended up taking a, elective drama class at San Diego state. Uh, and that was a fluke too, if I'm being honest, because I, I went to, I was fulfilling all the requirements for my, that I needed. And I still needed one elective, but I wasn't going to do it for a semester back. And one of my classes got canceled and I was working 30 hours a week in a restaurant and taking uh time and a half, a full load. And then another half a load at school. 
And so I didn't, I couldn't not have a class at this specific hour. So I came out, walked across the little, you know, what do they call it? The, the plaza or whatever at the university there. And then went into a drama class and the teacher's like, you can't be in this class. There's just, there's like 15 people trying or there was, there was 35 people trying to crash it the first day. And then it whittled down every day. And there was two of us that just never left. Hmm. And we weren't even in the class and we'd been going for you're like, like auditing the class or whatever right yeah for six weeks she's like fine you're in the class i was like oh thanks um but in that particular class i ended up falling in love with it and so i knew i was going to try and pursue what i do now and i the day i graduated i didn't i didn't walk at graduation or any of that it wasn't my jam i got in my car packed up my stuff and i drove to los angeles and lived in LA for a decade before I ever lived anywhere else. And just from day one, just started jamming, just started going. It was a, it was a different world then though, too. And you can make a better living doing commercials. And so when I was learning how to become an actor, learning how to act, even I was doing auditioning for commercials a lot. And that was a time in the past when if you did a couple of good commercials a year, I mean, you could buy yourself a house, you know, um, those right. days are gone by now. But um, so I was in, I was able to work my way through it and study it. And I've, you know, here I am. I've been doing it for 25 years and I'm still studying. I, I, it's just the way I operate. But it started it started from like just kind of a couple of fluke things. And then I decided I wanted to really go for it. Uh, and then, I mean, honestly, I had to decide I really wanted to go for it because, it's, you know, I quickly learned it's not an easy profession. So. so the first project I ever saw of you, um, I'm, I'm not going to lie, is the Brotherhood, you know, Absolutely. and yeah. uh, and you worked with David Dakota. Um, that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, you met him. You know him personally. Everybody I know has said his name in different ways. Is it Dakota, 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 you know, how, how do you say David's name? Uh, it depends. He would say Dakota. Dakota? Yeah, Dakota. 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 Okay. Uh, <laughs> but he also, he goes by David Dakota. That's fine. Okay. Uh, he's not, he's not a, he's not going to be crazy about it, but he, I, he, it's funny because he and I are, became good friends. And part of the reason for that was pretty simple for me is that he gave me a huge opportunity. I'd only been acting for two years. I was the lead in one of his films. Um, you know, we shot the whole thing in four days. We were like 25 pages a day, which is absurd. It's insane. Um, and, it was like it was a boot camp for acting and it was really amazing and fun and um i respected that he i knew what the movies were i knew who the audience was and i respected that he didn't take advantage or ask anybody to do anything that would push a line or make them feel overly uncomfortable um and in fact has been somebody kind of my whole career has always been there to throw you know we have dinner and we would have coffee and drinks and all the time whatever you know uh, over the course of the last 20 what three years i've known him and he's he's always giving advice about like bradley don't you give it away don't you you know and he's like the boys are still going to come for you you need to be careful and i was like he was just very genuine about it um because he over the course of his career i mean how many movies has he done now three or four hundred uh yeah he, <laughs> i was i was thinking three or four three or, yeah three or four billion it seems like uh, like uh, you see it and he does like a movie, I feel like every month, maybe, or if not two. He's slowing down now, but he, uh, and that's by choice, but he, uh, he's, he's somebody who just really cares. And, you know, everybody would have a different experience with him, but I, I mean, personally, I don't know anybody that had an experience the, where he got weirder or he was creepy or anything. He was always very really respectful. He really loved his job and he loved his boys. He did. And there was nothing wrong with that because, he was giving them an opportunity to be part of these movies. And he had these casting directors who did all their movies with him. And I think one or two of them, they might've both passed by now. Uh, oh, just Cause I remember that uh, every single time I would see one of his movies, it, it almost felt like the same people in the crew or whatever, like uh, Howard Wexler was like the uh, DP for a lot of them. And, you know, a lot yeah, of yeah, these. Yeah. Well, uh, he, knew, he, had, he had a formula and it worked. And what was funny about the brotherhood is, you know, all of his movies back in the day ended up at Blockbuster, right? Mm -hmm. That was, he told me this, it was so funny because the Blockbuster was based in Texas, I think at the time, I mean, Dallas maybe. And I said, I said, Dave, how do how did Blockbuster end up with all your movies? Because I got phone calls from like Eastern Washington, where I'm from West, I'm from outside of Seattle. And I have friends in Eastern Washington and they would call me, this is before cell phones, you know, they call me from their landline at home. Stringer, I just walked into this room and you're a, 
Uh, it wasn't before cell phones, the beginning of cell phones. Yeah, there, I walked into the thing at, at Blockbuster, and you guys are three whole, your movie's three whole like walls. And I was laughing because so I'd be like, Dave, what is this thing with the guys at Blockbuster? How come they love your movies? And he's like, Bradley, there's three queens in Dallas that love my stuff. And I was like, that's so fabulous. I died. And so that's why they bought every one of his movies for years until they went away. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And uh and so you worked with him for uh, you know a, a few movies I know at least that you did the Brotherhood then you did uh Final Stab which I'm a huge Scream fan so like that was like David Dakota doing Scream which was freaking oh, awesome. And yeah. then uh we'll see the uh, I know Wolves of Wall Street as well which yeah, you know yeah. I think you had a smaller part so I'm pretty sure that was at the time you were starting to get out there a little bit more and you were probably weren't able to do like a lead role. You yeah, know that whatever. was it. that was like that was the beginning of me working a lot more outside of um, sort of indie stuff and, you know, working way into television, things like that. And so, yeah, it was uh, Dave and I have always remained good friends. I really still like the guy. He, I think he's funny and charming and we have a good laugh together. Um, and, and then from there, of course, you know, it's it's the thing that most people don't realize about being an actor is that you, not only do you have to learn how to do it and then you have to find a way to get jobs. But you also have to find a way to build confidence and you can be real. I, I am friends with so many very, very talented actors who just never really got a good shot to work. And so they didn't get to build that confidence and that little thing kind of stops the career from ever going. So Dave provided that thing where it's like, you know, two years into doing it, you go, well, I can be the lead in the movie. I already did it. Mm -hmm. So as you're working your way to become a lead in a much bigger movie, you have this belief in the back of your head that it's possible. Whereas if it never happened for you, it would seem like this mysterious thing that just happens to other people. Um, and I think Dave applied that, uh, afforded us that little bit of psychology, which was really, uh, I, I've always been grateful for. Yeah. And uh, so I always thought you were, I don't know if you, are, are you ever like, did you ever live in Canada? Because you've done a lot of films and television in Canada. So, yeah, well, so I ended up after a decade in LA, uh, I ended up going over to Canada and meeting my now wife up there. And so I, I am now a dual citizen, essentially, between Canada and the US, and she is as well. Um, and so, yeah, we work a lot up there. And, work a lot yeah i mean really we work everywhere now it's like la new york you name it I'm the only atlanta one. probably you know that's... that's the only market we haven't really cracked much yet is atlanta um wow but canada keeps us very busy uh it's i'm a huge fan of all things vancouver and canadian really but i really respect and appreciate they have a smaller community so there's a lot more work to go around and so there's a bit more of genuine support for each other there's a bit more of like when somebody gets the gig and it's your buddy going dude good job man that's amazing as opposed to it being a little bit more of the uh, la thing oh that's great i'm super excited for you yeah but then they're gonna go stab you in the back and <laughs> yeah or they just don't want to talk to you for about two months because they're a bit pissed off you got it not them you know i um, know which is just and listen, there's 360, what 336 million people in the US, or something like that. Then there's 36 million in Canada. So the extra 300 million creates that energy. And I can't fault it because I'm I'm an American born and raised, you know, through and through. And I understand how much harder we have to fight for things. So I also understand how it's a little bit harder to not for it not to be you. And then when you're in a place where there's enough for everyone, it's just easier. It's uh, but I think that I got very lucky. And um, most people make the joke, you know, you meet a Canadian, they get to their green card in the U.S. They're like, oh, they married you for your green card. And I was like, nobody thinks about it the other way. Like, maybe I married her for my green card up there. <laughs> and, it, and it's actually kind of true because it's been a blessing in disguise. And it's a, it's it's allowed me to be part of, a, of what I think is a very special community as well. So uh, you, you got to work on like Smallville, you know, and and stuff like that. I mean uh that that's got to be you know i mean playing oh, well you you played dead shot if i'm correct uh correct yeah yeah i was the actual first dead shot which is funny most people don't know that i was the first time they turned it into a human yeah so there you go so the yeah. first dead shot and you got to actually because I, I i was doing more research and i was looking up um 
uh, on YouTube and I saw the clip from, uh, I guess it's, uh, was it um, uh, episode two from season 10 or whatever, where you're going after Carrie Lynn Pratt and stuff who I'm a huge fan of hers too. Like I love her as well. So um, I don't, I don't know if you were, yeah, you know, if you, if you knew her very well, you know, I just knew her when I worked with her. Right. And then that, that was a very quick relationship. That was, it was unfortunate because I, I, I've been auditioning for that show for years and I got close to a couple of other parts, um, kind of all super villain type guys. And then I ended up getting that one, which was great. But then I, the show quickly found out that they were going to be done. So I got to do two episodes in the end. And then it was funny because then they rebooted the, the everything through Arrow the very next year. And uh, I was teaching acting at the time as well. And I coached one of my students on this part for Deadshot. <laughs> <laughs> that then went to my buddy to one of my students who he was a really nice guy it was great and he was perfect for it but it was really funny because i was like i just had this part they're completely <laughs> changing the character to a new thing like not a sort of cowboy guy instead more of like a square jawed handsome sniper guy with tattoo i saw i think it was and i was like oh man i was like this is so funny it's so because you know in there the guys that make these shows they're like we just started playing with deadshot we want to keep him around and then they were like but we're starting a new thing so we need all new people and so then we'll just revamp it and keep them and so it was just not good timing on my part <laughs> well i mean you did you you were on an episode of arrow but i don't know did you play a villain on that no and on that one i actually ended up being a guy who was the, that was the stuck in a loop episode like the groundhog day one where we did like three versions of the same three or four versions of the same story um and i was the guy robbing something in that that was okay. the, yeah, yeah, yeah the back so and, and arrow had, uh, the green arrow had to come after you or whatever well arrow because yes, they never call him the green arrow because i guess they thought that was too cheesy right. Yeah, right. or he, something he did, have, he did have green somewhere in his outfit didn't he he believe he did he did he had a green hood you know kind of like i guess what you're wearing right now you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. You but go. you could be the green arrow now if they reboot well, that know. again this is my audition and done <laughs> <laughs> um you know it's it's funny because you're right like the, right now they're actually they've ended the um the Arrowverse, you know, like Flash is done and, and all that stuff. And I think like Super all of them are done. And uh I don't know if they're gonna they're gonna have to reboot that at some point. It's just gonna be a little different or something because well it's right now it's the the host is gone. The host is going away. CW is changing, is revamping everything. Oh uh, wow. So the CW is now it got I don't know if it got like it got purchased, I believe. So like if you just if you're kind of sitting back and watching what they're doing, um, the CW just picked up a contract for golf, and the rumor is is that they're going to be doing um a lot of reality television. Well, that kind of sucks. That reminds me of like the USA days, you know, where USA used to be like up all night and all these other other stuff, and then it got revamped, and now it's just like wrestling and other things that have nothing to do with interesting to see what happens because the cw is uh was a sort of a bigger entity and um i don't know like but their viewership was never really super high do you know what i'm saying like mm. um i'm sure all of the the arrowverse as you call it will, will come back in some capacity but i mean with all these different apps and streamers and things it'll just be somewhere different Will probably be max the uh because that's run by warner brothers so you know and everything they'll probably and it's dc so they'll probably somehow do that i wouldn't be surprised um it's just yeah, it, it would probably be a little different though it would probably not be so young you know it might be a little bit there might be more of an adult feel and also a little bit more grit to it not so uh polished and pretty who knows? Maybe I'm wrong, but it, it, there's a lot of things that could change. And that would be quite interesting, actually, wouldn't it? If there was like a whole group of shows like that, that were really dark night, you know, dark and gritty. And like, that would be exciting, I think. But yeah, I mean, they really haven't done that in a while, you know, so having that as a superhero thing, like superheroes with edge, like the Batman, the Batman was a perfect example of that because, you know, you, you look at that and, um, it's it's just it's darker, it's grittier and stuff. But then you look in Joker, you know that those two are, you know. But then you look at a lot of more of the other stuff. They're a little bit lighter and a little bit more kid friendly, you know, and stuff. 100%. Which, you know, so I I 
Also love that you were in freaking uh, Supernatural, one of my favorite shows of all time, by the way. Like, I absolutely love that show. And, and that you played two roles, two different roles, not the same roles. So um, yeah. how did that happen? It's, it's the show went on for forever. <laughs> you know, so people just forgot. Like <laughs> after a certain amount of time, they would recycle people, right? And so I got to play two totally different people. The second time around, I actually worked with a young woman who I'm sure you're familiar with, Catherine Newton, who mm-hmm. who ended up, of course, being in the new Ant is the Ant Man movie. Ant Man movie, yeah. Yeah, and I mean she's done, she's blown up and become, but she we, she just happened to be doing her arc of what eight episodes or whatever at the same time, so our characters crisscrossed, and she was young and very very sweet and lovely, and um, it's actually a funny fact most people don't know this, but she's she's almost or is a professional golfer. She, she is she is such a good golfer; it's shocking she can drive the ball so far. Did you play like, golf with her? Uh, no, her and uh, Jared, no, Jensen, her and Jensen were driving balls, which apparently they did at the end of every day into the water. We were right on a river and it was, it was crazy because she was blasting the ball and it, she's this tiny little thing. And she was at that time, I think she might've been 15 or something. And I was like, what is happening? Um, is, yeah. Is Jensen a golfer? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that he's, you know, of course. Yeah. He, Yes, he's got he's got enough money to do it. I just don't know how much time he has. Um, right, because well, at least back then when they were doing Supernatural, that seems to be all they could barely do. You know, I mean, that was what ten months a year on that thing. I mean, and their families lived in Texas. It was just a big. They had a private plane that they went back and forth on and all that because they were like just trying to survive and have lives. But they, they there was a that was a long period of time for them. They sacrificed a lot, and they you know they got comp but yeah i mean and also him and jared are both just very very nice guys very nice guys yeah i've never heard a bad thing about either one of those guys you know ever you know so i i can I mean, sort of see that and um it's one Jensen of those, was, there's certain, there's, there's certain times when you meet there's certain times when you meet somebody that you you have this preconceived notion where you're kind of like <clears throat> I don't want to say you don't want them to be good people, but when you, you know, you walk into a room and there's these two, six, three strapping dudes that are just absolutely stunning. You kind of like, maybe they're dicks at least so that nobody likes them. <laughs> you're right. like, no, no, they're also so nice. And you're like, they're just better. <laughs> <So they'll win. laughs> Moving on. And, and yeah, well, that that's how it, sh- it really should be. But, you know, it's not the case. Like you said, like most of the time you probably think, oh, they're probably dicks. And then, Either they are, you know, and stuff, or they're just, you know. Sometimes you meet people and you're like, wow, you're, some people are a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But doing those two roles, I mean, did you, did you have a lot of fun? Was it something like on set, like just being on there was a great time? I had a great time. And it's all, it's all, I call it the trickle down, right? So whoever's show it is, Jared and uh, Jensen's show, um, Whoever's at the top oftentimes determines the energy of how the show goes. So if you end up on a show where somebody's very difficult and angry and they don't, or they just don't care, they don't learn their lines or there's a million different versions of the person who's not fun to work with. Um, and that's always hard because you're there and you want to do the job and you're in a toxic set where everybody's on edge and the crew doesn't like the actors because number one's not nice to them or whatever it is. These things happen. And then there's shows like that where the number one, in, they're they're great to everyone. So everybody's just having a good time and everybody's having a laugh and everybody feels like they matter and they're valuable. So going on to those shows is a blast. You have a, yeah. you have a really nice time. Yeah, you see all the like outtakes of them just acting goofy and being silly and, and just having a good time. And and that that to me, like you considering it's not really a comedy, you know, you see that more on comedies, but it's not a comedy. It's more where everything's being taken very seriously, you know, and everything. There is comedy in it throughout, which I think is what I, what kept me going for the show, you know, period was like that. I would laugh enough, you know, and stuff enough be engaged in, and what was going on. You know, it's not just, Oh, we're going to try to scare you. Cause I think the first season, was a little bit more scary. Then it got a little bit more fun and more goofy and more, you know, sure. whatever. Yeah, sure. And I like that. There's, yeah. Easy, fun show to work on. Always a good time. Nothing bad to say about it. 
So let's let's talk about your like audition process. Like, do you have anything that you do to prepare to get ready for an audition? Well, now the caveat is that I've been doing it for 25 years, I think now. So the, you know, the truth is there's a lot of mechanics and a lot of homework that goes into it. So well, I have a process when I get it sent to me from when, from that point until I film it and send it off. Cause it's all done by us now. Right. Um, there's, that's a, that's a certain sort of process, but what goes into the subconscious of all that is a lot of years of just learning and training. So one of the best ways for me to explain it is, is that, um, you know, the work that I do on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday will inform the audition I get on Friday that I send on Saturday, but Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday had nothing to do with that, but it's all acting. Um, I call it like acting gym work, right? The workouts that informs it. So the best way for me is to say, like, I realized when I was in my twenties and I was like, in your twenties in Hollywood, a lot of what's going on is a, uh, it's a, like a modeling contest, the best looking people win. And so it's not, because the truth is, is that most people don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> so right. it's like there's a very small group of people who are studied theater and grew up in it and they're amazing and they'll work. And then there's the rest of us trying to figure it out. And so then it comes down to, well, like who's easier to look at? And then you hire those people. So I was like, oh, for me to work a lot in this business, I'm going to have to become very good at my job. So one of the things I did is I just started studying a lot every week, all the time, study, 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 become better, 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 better. And here I am 25 years later. And I still every Tuesday go to my group and I call it my gym. I go to my gym and we work out. I go to my gym and we work out. I go to my gym and we work out. All of that is what makes everything I do from getting the audition to sending it off happen. So the actual process of it is no different than anybody else. You get it, you read it a few times, you highlight it, you write down all your stuff you need to write down for your work. Um, get ready to do it. You figure out the blocking of it. You set up your camera, you film it with your friend or your, for me, my wife, and then send it off. And then I pretend it never existed and move on to the next thing, or I move on to life, you know, being a dad again. And so everything that happens again on Tuesdays or on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday informs everything that happens for the auditions in there. And then you send it off. But it's, for me, it's about the preparation that happens weekly, not just about like, Oh, I got it. Now I'll just start. Now I'll start working. That's where really, I've always think of it in terms of um, sports athlete, like an athletic sort of event. So if you think of somebody like a LeBron James or a Kobe Bryant, you know, two of the best that have ever played this, their game, or you think about a Michael Jordan, who's the best that's ever played the game. And you hear the stories about this are all the same. They worked harder than everybody else. They showed up first and they left last. They did five extra workouts each week more than anybody else. And you're going, people, so people will say to me, like, why are you still doing your acting gym every Tuesday? And I'm like, staying sharp. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. to do, keeping myself ready to go in shape, staying in shape. And then they'll be like, I just don't get it, but don't you know what you're doing? And I'm like, let me rephrase the way you think about it. If you didn't go to the gym for a year, what would you look like? You probably wouldn't look like a stud. Right. <laughs> if you go to the gym three to five times a week for a year, what are you going to look like? Probably going to look pretty good. You can be in pretty good shape, right? Um, using that one metaphor, people go, oh, that's interesting. I was like, so when I step in front of the camera, I'm the guy that's in pretty good shape. Um, and so that's more, it's easier for, for the audience to relate to. You know, there's all these different things that come from it, right? Um, but it's about really just staying on top of it always. And so I've, you know, first you want to sprint, get the big job, get paid, and then figure your life out, right? I'm a lifer in this. I love it. It's what I love doing. And so for me, it's a marathon, slow and steady. Just keep going, slow and steady, slow and steady. But also never getting to a point where I'm like, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to leave it alone now. Um, I'm more of the kind of person who's like, yeah, I know what I'm doing, but I wonder if there's a play out there that would be very hard for me to do. And then if I find that play, like how now how can I get that play going? And spend the next six months really busting my ass and coming out on the other side of that a different person, different actor. So that's a long answer to a short question, but <laughs> it's no, it's a fair, it's a fair thing. Um, I just, I love your uh, thought process of like, I just send it out and uh, you know, and, and, and don't, you know, you don't worry about whether or not you got the part. You just use it as like, well, it's, that's out there, if whatever happens, but are there any ones that like, are there any, you know, you know, jobs that you're just like, man, I really hope I get this job, you know? Pretty much most of them. But um, 
there's a, there's been a few very very good jobs that eluded me um for sure but the thing i will tell you this and this is something i realized years ago is if you're auditioning to get work then being an actor is an awful profession it's the worst profession because if you're successful that you're still going to fail 95 percent of the time maybe 98 percent of the time it's just the way the business goes you don't you don't get most um, but if you're, all you want from it is like, I reframe my way of thinking. So when I get the sides and I get it, I go, wow, I get to play this character. That's interesting. I don't say, I hope I get to play this character when they hire me. I don't care about that. I have no control over that. I'm six foot one. If they want a guy that's five foot five, I'm not getting the job. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If they want a, uh, a, um, an Asian man or an Indian man or an African American man, I don't get the job. So I don't get to think about that part. That part's not about, I can't, I have no control over that. So why would I worry about it? But they gave me this opportunity to play this character. And that's kind of exciting. This character is going to be fun. Let's see what we can do with him. So I dive in for the next two days and really pull it apart and put it, oh, this will be great. And then I'll do that. Okay, here we go. And I live it out. And then when I'm done and I send it off, I was like, man, that was a good time. I had a really good time playing that guy. What do I do next? Moving on. Because my job there ends and I have no control over it after that. So if I put every, if I put any sort of, time and energy into the, oh my gosh, I hope it happens part, then all I'm going to do is create a world in which I'm going to be very unhappy and frustrated. So I choose not to. Um, Is there times when I'm like, oh, I really hope that one works out. And I think about it a couple of times for the next week. Yeah, of course there is. Uh, Or it goes incredibly well. And I'm like, oh, that would be so great to get that job. Of course there is. But uh, I don't hold on to it. And also, ultimately, that's why work begets work. So if I'm busy, which is right now I'm busy, right? I'm so you know blessed to be busy and at this time when it's really slow. I just finished one movie and you know that's why we couldn't, I forgot last time. I had this break and then I go start another one tomorrow. Um, when I'm working, it's easier to get another job because I honestly, I don't have time to think about anything. <laughs> like, I do all the work, I send it off and I don't have time to think. I got to go back to set and figure out how to play the guy I'm playing again, you know? But what's this scene, you know? Um, that's why I feel like work really begets work uh, a lot in this business. Because when you send it off, you don't harp about it in your brain and do that thing where you create energy that pushes it away from you, right? Um, if you also think about just the logical way, if you if you're somebody who really desperately wants to get married, let's say, and you go to a bar on Friday night and you walk in there and you're like, oh, I really hope I can find my partner tonight. You're not finding a partner. You're not <laughs> going to find anything. They're going to be so far away. If you go into that bar going, I hope I I hope the last thing I find is a partner. And I just want to have a good time tonight. People are going to be drawn to you and they're going to be like, ooh, we should hang. I don't know. I'm busy, man. I'm bu- Ooh, that's even more exciting. All right. Because not pushing it away with that desperation right it's just again it's another egg sort of anecdote that's kind of logical of me that's why how i met your mother took 10 seasons before they uh you know actually brought ted to his his wife you know because it uh took 10 years or whatever of him you know whatever and i i i don't know if you ever watched the show or not or uh, did you did you ever you weren't a part of it right you weren't a part of that oh, show no, no, I, didn't do that. I watched uh, i only watched a little bit at the beginning and then i you know i got busy so <laughs> yeah yeah do you do you get time to watch tv much yes but very you know like it, it my limitations on watching stuff is more about being a husband and a father so you know i'm gonna go pick up my son from school here in a little bit and that'll be the rest of my night until i they'll read him stories and put him to bed you know and then i'll be with my wife and then that'll be our time and so my limitations are that but like my wife and i are just you know right now we're because i was away working we just spent the last two days tearing through all the succession we hadn't seen and we're obsessed with it you know um so you we find our different places to land but then she has the short shows that she'll watch and all of mine that i'll watch when we're apart and i'm filming on location or she's on location because she's an actor as well right um because i've also i i mean not only do i act i'm also a writer and director and so I like to study other shows to see what ideas are coming up and go, Oh man, this is interesting. And I'm always taking notes in my journal about things. And um, I, I often have to watch a show too, because I get an audition for a show that's been around for three years and I go, I've never seen this show. What is this? I just did it uh, like a three weeks ago for the, I think it was snowfall or something. And I was watching and I was like, what is this show? I love it. It's been around forever. I never watched it. And became quickly obsessed with it, but it, that came because I was needed to study the tone of it for an audition I was doing. Yeah. So you you think of like you know it as spending time with your family, 
and slash research. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and it drives my wife nuts. When I watch a movie, I'm, I'm always putting honey, you know, why that doesn't work and she's like i don't what and i'll <laughs> and i'll tell her why the story point didn't work because it landed in the wrong spot or i'm like they've inverted the way story works here and i just don't see it or like the character just defied themselves for this reason and she's like oh geez just watch the show you do you know? ever do that for your own movies uh what do you mean in what regard? like like if you watch you what is something that you've been in like a tv show or a movie do you ever go oh man i wish I wish they hadn't done that take or I wish that hadn't happened necessarily. Oh, absolutely. And the old, the farther along you go in this business, the more you, you know, maintain enough control over what it is you're doing so that that doesn't happen. So you don't, you don't present anything to people where that's a possibility. If that right. makes um, but um, generally speaking, I, I'm not a person that doesn't watch anything. I don't do that, but I also don't watch everything. You know, there's a lot. I would say I've only seen 25% of the stuff I've done, and that might be generous. Oh, wow. It might be more. And it's not, it, it's because I read the script and I went and did it. I don't need to see it. I already, I already, I already had the, like, I already watched the show. I, in my, like, I feel like I've already accomplished it. Like, it feels like it's redundant to me to sit down and go, I, cause then I'm like, I already know what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm, not, like, I'm not entertained by this. Yeah, you've read the script, you know, you know, uh, you, you know, even if your part's smaller than, the, you know, the bigger cast, you, you've read, read the script, you've seen everything, you know, it's, you know, the girl, girl gets the guy at the end, you know, the end, you know. There's a lot of times when I'll read scripts for like auditions or things like that. And I'm so enthralled with the idea of what the story is of the script that when the movie comes out and I wasn't in it, that I'll be like, oh, I'm watching that. And I'll be like, wow, they made a better movie than that that was on the page. Or more, what happens more, I believe, is that I'll watch it and be like, oh, uh, they could have done these things or this thing or whatever, you know. Um, and I also just sometimes find it's intriguing when you see the actor that played the part you were auditioning for. And there's a few times where I'm like, wow, they hired the right actor and it wasn't me. <laughs> you know, I was like, they definitely made the right choice here. So I give them I give them props on that too, right? You know, I kind of view that and also in like real life situations of like, if I didn't get the girl, you know, or whatever, and yeah. then I see the guy that she's with, I'm like, that guy's perfect for her. Or if the guy's an asshole, then I'm like, well, she missed out, you know, <laughs> like, so it's kind of like that, I guess. But, uh, you know, also, think of it in terms of how many, like, think of it in terms of like relationships or uh, even for me for like auditioning for TV shows or whatever else there's a lot of people on the planet. So, so like, just because you didn't get the one doesn't mean that there ain't going to be thousands more, you know? And I feel that way about acting stuff too. Like when the jobs that I really want don't come my way, there's going to be another opportunity soon for another good one, you know? So don't get caught up. I think as young, you sort of younger actors or people younger to the business get so caught up on that one magical thing. Oh, it's the new Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones thing or whatever. And I'm like, it'd be great to get that part. You're not wrong, but you're going to be okay if you don't get it. Yeah. Uh, you just have to rewire your brain around it, you know? Um, and, you know, that comes just from being around for a long time. Well, I mean, I, I see a lot of people in the indie scene because, you know, that's where I'm at. But, like, I see a lot of them, a lot of actors who get really bummed out when they don't, when they when they lose out a part. And I mean, I, I'll always remind them that like, you know, it, it wasn't your fault, you know, like it just wasn't, you're just not what they were looking for. And I, I get it. It's very disheartening, you know, when, when they constantly get <laughs> rejected and it, nothing seems to be working, you know, like I get that, but I would rather them have your mindset of like, yeah, it's, it's gone. It's out. If, if I get it, I get it, you know, kind of thing. If I don't, you know, I'll move on. And there's also another thing you can do to like, to keep yourself motivated and not um, victim me. You know, I'm playing the victim card. Like I can't believe nobody likes me. It just doesn't work. And for me, it was the, and I decided this when I was about five years in. And so here I am 20 years later, I was like, and I'll remind myself from time to time about this. I'm like, what if you, and I would challenge myself. I'd be like, what if you become so good at your job that they, just they don't want you but they have to hire you they can't say no 
They want to hire their cousin or the person that's better looking or shorter or younger, but they have to rewrite it for you because you're just that fucking good. So I'm not saying that I'm there, but what I am saying is that that's always a pursuit. And so mm -hmm. within that pursuit of getting better and growing all the time, I do present something that sometimes is quite appealing and which causes people to go, I didn't see it this way, but maybe we will go this way. Um, and that comes from the integrity of never stopping the process of growth. And that comes from the integrity of weekly work and taking ownership that this profession is not like anything. It's not unlike anything else in life, whether it be relationships, being a dad, going to the gym, um, eating healthy. You have to constantly be on top of these things. Otherwise, you don't cultivate it and it won't grow, you know, um, and once you kind of approach it from that place, it's easier to keep going. And it doesn't take all your effort. It just takes some effort. And that's what I think is interesting because people are like, I don't have any time. I don't have any. I'm like, I, if, if I have time, everybody does. So. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> absolutely. And yeah. I, I love hearing that kind of stuff. Like I, um, I, I feel like people just need to focus, you know, more on the positives. You know, I did a great job. I did the best job I could do. Then, you know, the negatives of like, well, you know, you know, even if you didn't do a good job, that's okay. You know, like that's okay. Some days you're not gonna, you're not gonna be there, you know, and uh, that's fine too. So I, I just feel like people, I, I think are too hard. Maybe you say they play the victim, but they're too hard on themselves sometimes. And I think, especially in this industry, you gotta just let it go. You know, well, like life is hard, especially right now, you know, with state of the world and inflation. And, and, you know, it seems like everybody's angry at each other. And it's just like it's it's a tough place, you know. Um, and there's enough. If you wanted me to go walk around my neighborhood and have everybody tell me all the negative things that they want to tell me about for their for their day or week, I would not probably be gone for a month. <laughs> right. You know? listening to stories because there's just so much and so it's like i'm not saying those things aren't valid and the, that they're not real things i'm just saying i choose not to let them be what i focus on and so what i choose to focus on is things that make me smile and things that i think are positive and things where i think that uh you know sometimes the sometimes the win is the growth <laughs> sometimes the win is within the failing right um so you know you watch the thing you do the thing you send it in you, you know you know like oh let's be it could be you're at the bar and you see some oh she, she she is so great looking i just would really love to talk to him you talk to him and they're like i'm in a relationship and you're like oh great <laughs> you or you can go home being like you know i'm a miserable person who blew it or you can go i just met a really cool person tonight and that was awesome there's two ways to view it. You can view it as a loss or like a victory. And the victory would come from like just spinning it in your brain. So like if you have an audition, you don't get the part going. But what a great time I had playing that character. And I actually think I learned something today. Great. That's kind of nice. So I would view it from that angle. And I also do, I also do believe in the sort of karma bank of life. Um, every time you put a deposit in and you put yourself out there and don't get it. You have you've put money in the karma bank and it'll open up and come your way and then you'll get that part or you'll get the five in a row or you know here i am during all this crazy strike business is about to happen and we have what 30 35 days until the whole thing closes down and i'm gonna finish a movie like 10 days before the strike and i'm like i was able to get two movies in before the strike i was like that's just karma bank stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? That's just banking it right now and staying positive and not going like becoming an angry fucker. And then that karma bank falls in your lap and you're like, well, this will be great. This is going to get me through the summer. I love this. You know, um, that's a, it's a good, good place to be here. So you're, you're a writer too. So like, how do you feel about this strike? Do you, do you, I mean, I don't know if you want to say like your opinion on it necessarily, but you know, it all, it all needs to happen. Because uh, all of these professions have become hobbyist professions where, you know, you then people outside of it don't understand what I mean. Like they don't understand, like you're an actor and you made, let's say it's, you made $15,000 in for working for eight days. And it's like, okay, yeah, sure. But I also didn't get paid one. I didn't get paid anything for the three months ahead of that, that I did 56 auditions for. And in fact, in the end that cost me money because I was also in class every week and that cost me $500 a month. And I had to drive myself around and I had to do afford the thing and the thing and the 
thing. So I created about thirty thousand dollars in debt in the time to get there to make the fifteen, and I fifteen is not going to cover it anymore because life is too expensive. So all we're doing is trying to get on par, and the problem is it all got too top heavy. So you know they released the graphic at the beginning of the strike where like the top eight CEOs of these streamers and companies made from the top was three hundred eight million a year, and the bottom was thirty eight million a year. And that's how much the person running it makes. And I'm not saying it's easy to be a CEO. That's a hard job. But I also do think that there is more to go around than they're alluding to. So right. the person that's writing for your TV show that's scraping by and living in a really shitty apartment in North Hollywood, you don't have any extra money to pay them for residuals because it's airing so much and it's popular. I think that's not true. And I think that there should be, it, there should be some sort of equality, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also like, I think of it from the blue collar actor perspective, not from like the perspective of The Rock or whoever that makes 20 million every you know movie. From the blue collar actor perspective, uh, acting has become a hobbyist profession. You can't, uh, you can't be just a blue collar actor anymore. And I, when I say blue collar, I mean somebody that does one episode of this, maybe two episodes of this. Maybe they do an independent movie over here. Maybe they do another thing over here. I'm not talking about the people that are on the show every week. Those people are making a nice living. Um, it depends on the network. Sometimes they're not making as much, but, um, so if you're one of those blue collars that goes from job to kind of like that, you have to, have, in order to get there, you have to have like two or three other jobs to help you live, to pay for gas in your kid's school and for food and all these other things. Cause just being an actor alone doesn't pay enough to survive anymore. They're called survivor but, jobs for that reason. You know? <laughs> like... Yeah. And they, and I believe, I believe when I started acting, I think a guest star 25 years ago paid in the neighborhood of $5,000. And today, if you're on one of the networks, it goes up to $8,000. And if you're doing a Netflix show, they can offer you $4,500, which is a pay cut from 25 years ago. So if you do the math on it, you're like, this is not magic inflation, even remotely close. Used to be a good job, not a good job anymore. Got to fix it. It's broken. There's a little bit too much of looking at the people in front of the camera and the people that write the shows and looking at them and going, you're replaceable. I don't need you. And with writers, I'm like, you do need them. If they didn't write this content, you wouldn't have a bit in industry. And so I believe they're going to get there. They're going to get a lot of what they're asking for because they're too important. Um, I know there's that AI stuff, the the situation with that, and that scares the shit out of me because, like you said, they need writers, and if they go, you know, uh, please write me an episode of Supernatural, and it's just the most basic, boring thing because an AI guy doesn't know how to, you know, AI, not guy, but AI thing, bot. you know, bot doesn't know how to how to write something with heart and soul because it doesn't have one. It's just, you know, it'll be, it'll be a gimmick for this reason. And when I say gimmick, I'm like, unless you find a way to bring the human element in, it's going to be exactly what you just said. It doesn't understand human emotion. It doesn't understand the truth of situations. It can write dialogue. That's right. It can do perfect structure, but it will not make, they won't put in the human element that makes us go what is that it just won't happen it would it's it's impossible it'll make robotic stories Mm -hmm. i feel robotic and they feel like because i mean i've been writing for so long i'll read a script and i'll be like yeah the mechanics are perfect but i feel nothing i don't feel anything i don't care Mm -hmm. so it'll happen we'll watch a bunch of movies that were made by robots and everybody will be like i don't know if i get it so what they what one of the things that was propose that a peer writer will hate is that the robot writes it and then they hire a writer to make it a human story. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. So you provided you with the structure and all that. And then for the next two or three months, a human will morph it. So a peer writer from like toes up will hate this idea. It's going to be, that would become, I can see that becoming a thing, but I can't see the peer robotic stories being getting anywhere. I think we'll watch a couple of them and we'll be so disconnected and care so little that it'll go away, but it'll happen for a minute because the gimmick will, it'll be exciting to see what a computer came up with. Do you know what I mean? Um, You know, also if you think of it this way, like there's computer algorithms or whatever that are the best chess players on planet earth. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's also people that play chess and there's the best on the planet earth. So 
as far as I know, the only crowds they gather to watch people play chess are humans. They gather to watch humans play chess because that's more, they don't gather to watch these algorithms fight. That's just done for a couple of people sitting at home. Do you get my point? Right. It's good. It's not, without the human element, it's not fascinating. It's not exciting. It's also just kind of like sitting down and go, a robot wrote this? That might be exciting for a second. And then you're like, I don't like it. I can't connect to it. Um, it also, I, you start to go, well, how much is, what is this costing us as people? Um, and that'll also come into account to some people's heads. And I, I think we just get excited by technology and that's all I think is happening. But I don't think the idea of it replacing actual writers is a joke. That's the same thing as making movies with all holograms. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you can't connect to a hologram, man. It's just not possible. There's no soul in there. I mean, I, I think that's the thing, though. Like you were saying earlier that, like, you know, it was the fascination that we have because, like, when uh, freaking uh, Tupac came on, you know, came yep. back to life, you know, yep. for uh, was it Coachella or something? You know, yep. one of those yep. things. Those yep. big events. They were like, people are like, oh, my God, he's a, he's back alive. And, or uh, Star Wars bringing all these characters like uh, Grand Moff Tarkin back to life, you know, and stuff like that. And you're like, that's that's amazing like that that can it's happen fascinating so, totally yeah. fascinating but that's all it was yeah we all watched it for two weeks we watched it endlessly and then now we don't give a shit yeah because like it, the problem being is that like we're, we want we want people you know we want to see these people we don't want to see robots so well, i get it was, how many movies have you seen with marlon brando or james dean in the last two years um new movies well i mean it's been a while but i i like you know maybe godfather you know somewhat yeah, no, no, i mean like i mean new ones that were just oh. made. not that none. i know of none. none because none have been made guess what we could do right now we could put them in a movie 100 percent, we could put them in a movie why haven't they been in a movie yet then that doesn't make any sense if we're all so excited about the hologrammy wild AI animation thing, then why aren't we watching movies with them in it? Because nobody really wants it. That's why. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's scary on paper. I got terrified when I realized that could happen. And then it was like, it was all on paper because there's people that have the money to make it happen, but they're like, I don't want to do that for some reason because they know we don't want it. There's the end of the conversation. I agree. I agree. So that that's great. And, uh, I love that. I love that you're able to get a, a movie before the strike happened and everything and, and get that stuff because that was that was what everybody was worried about was like, you know, if this strike happens, it's going to be a while and a lot of people are going to be out of work for for a bit. Um, and then I'm not sure, but I'm sure that because of the Writers Guild having that strike, that SAG I know their contracts up in June, so there's that talk. So I'm like, oh God, there's more <laughs> possibly coming. And I'm like, but that's that's you know the D DGA just got upset recently, you know. So like, there's a lot of this coming where we're just like the the unions are are fighting back and for good reason, you know. Um, and so I'm very I happy for that. Happens. I hope it all happens. I do too. I mean, um, we, we need to uh, make a living again. We deserve it. Absolutely. You're you're talking about before it was like way more, you know, you got paid more than the streamers are allowing you guys to. And that's kind of it's kind of not this cool. It's not an easy job. It's not an easy profession mentally or physically or just emotionally. It's very difficult. Um, and I'm not saying we're like, you know, soldiers at war. I'm not I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's not an easy profession. But to pay us as if we're always replaceable is insulting because mm -hmm. it's a hard and it takes a long time to learn how to do it and the people that do it well need to get paid well and i'm not talking about just the people at the very top i'm talking about all the people that support the people at the top because there's a show like succession where you have a lot of supporting actors in that show that are wonderful actors and they deserve to get a pay raise they do i really need to watch the session i haven't seen it yet like it's just there's been so much to watch and a lot of times i do reviews so like a lot of times i'm just watching movies i review then yeah. I watch, you know, it's like lately it's just been like watching like Law and Order or something, you know, because it's just simple to just watch all those episodes, you know, on one day or whatever. But totally get it. I totally get it. 
Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much. Um, before we go, I have a couple, one couple of little questions and then sure. I'll let you go. But first of all, what, what do you think was your, you know, was your favorite role that you've ever played? I, so I can't have a favorite because I've done too many, <laughs> um, but I can have some highlights. Um, one of my ones that I, that always jumps into my head because it was a sort of a turning point was when I played Skipjack on the Lizzie Borden Chronicles. Oh, nice. Um, which was the Christina Ricci, uh, Cole Hauser show. Uh, and that's just cause he's, it was a, I, I did a show. I did, I think six episodes of it. Um, my mom of course called everybody and told him but he's going to be on the show. And one of her friends called him because I watched the show. I'm so sorry. And my mom goes, what are you, why are you sorry? Well, cause Bradley wasn't in the show. And she goes, He's in six episodes. He's in a ton of the show. What are you talking about? She goes, no, he wasn't. I watched the show. She goes, he plays Skipjack. And she goes back and goes, I didn't even recognize it. Nice. So I was like, That's the highest compliment for me, right? Um, so I was <laughs> like, okay, I'll take that one. That was a, that one got a feather in my cap there. Um, and to be honest, just like some of the later jobs I've done, um, I really had fun in Devil in Ohio. Um uh, I did a movie called Crawl Space that I really enjoyed playing this character, Sterling, and that one just came out as a Paramount film. Uh, I was the bad guy in that one. Um, and then my uh, my wife and I and some very good friends made a movie at the very end of the pandemic called Sheltering Season, which is been it's out in the U.S. and it's coming out in Canada, I think, next. Uh, that was a, that was a movie I wrote and directed and acted in, and that was also something that are kind of close to the heart there as well. Uh, and, you know, and then, of course, there's always the things if I want to think more macro, like I had a really good time playing Deadshot. <laughs> you know I mean? right. It was a lot of fun. They made him look so cool. So uh, that there's things like that as well. So there's there is a lot, though. There's a lot to choose from. All right. Well, this kind of goes into that like thing of like, like, what is a role that you really, really want to play that you haven't gotten a chance to play yet? You know, it, I've played so many different types of people that I don't, I don't know. I think one of the roles, there's something that I'd like to grapple with, like just uh, sort of circumstantially would be sort of somebody with a sort of chronic PTSD would be intriguing to me or somebody that's in and out of a, some sort of drug addiction, psychosis. Uh, that's actually, there's a movie I wrote called The Confession that we're looking to make which would be a character like the one that's a lead in that, that'll be played by somebody uh, yeah, f higher up the, the flagpole than me, which is fine. Cause I'm going to direct it, <laughs> but um, it, characters, the, the more complex the character, the more I'm drawn to it. Um, I just played a, a serial killer in my last movie and I had a really good time playing this guy because it was so much work to find a way his brain worked. Um so it's the more layers that I can sort of play with that I'm intrigued by. So it's, it's really more about what the writer has done and what have they created that I can then add to or help fill up. And sometimes characters can be a little flat, which is not as fun, but if you find this really robust character and the ask of me as an actor is high, that's what I'm into. That's, that's awesome. Um, it sounds like you're more of like a Meisner actor, if I'm correct. But I did my four and a half years. Yeah, that's part. Okay. That's that's in there. <laughs> that's in there. All right. It's a big. There's a big trunk. There's a big trunk. I just to get towed around my tool bag, if you will. Okay. I, okay. I, so you you kind of like do multiple, you know, take, acting. I take from many many places. I don't that's, believe I'm not a purist. Not not at all. Not at all. Um. So my last question is: Do you have? micro goals and macro goals in your life do you have like things you want to do now as opposed to what you want to do like what's like your end goal basically it's funny because i love i love what i do so much that um you know most of my current goals are more wrapped around my family my son's only seven years old um it's about learning how to do that well uh and providing for them so there's, there's that, that's a sort of micro goal. Micro goal too is, is to stay on the path to getting access to playing more interesting parts, which has all been going very well for me for the last few years. And that just means to kind of keep the nose down and keep going, you know, 
Uh, and that's been going very well, and it feels like it's headed in the right direction. Macro goals are to get to do some of the bigger, more um, uh, higher-profile projects as you grow. I have no control over these things, though, and I think macro more of my macro goals are around my writing and directing and specifically i really really enjoy directing um i've directed three full-length films and i'd like to help that grow uh more as i go because the storytelling i mean energetically i'm somebody who likes to be the first one there and the last one to go to bed it's just the way i operate the more time i can spend in that seat the director's seat the better off i am also as an actor but it's just more i, I really love it and so that's there's a lot more goals i have in that regards in terms of like what i want to do in terms of telling stories and um filling up what's possible there um i'm a real firm believer in honesty and truth and uh helping other actors to facilitate telling a story and fulfilling that with their truth is something i really enjoy like if you watch any of my movies that i directed the one thing you'll come out of it saying is wow those actors are good and that's just because I've spent so much time learning how to do it myself that I make sure that they look incredible. Um, and, and that, you know, that feels right. That feels right to me. And also I get, I get pretty empowered when I, you know, I have a, we have a film, the sheltering season when I was talking about where it just got nominated for a bunch of awards. And one of the things that was, I was so excited about was, was that four of the actors in the film got nominated for awards. And that to me is very exciting because it was like, Oh, good. Because that means that, that means people are registering what I'm doing and they're seeing that that truth in there, which is nice. Well, thank you so much. I hope more people check out uh, Devil in Ohio and everything that you've been in. I mean, a lot of it's on Netflix, you know, as um, you know, people can check out a lot of your work already. Um, and what and I think the Brotherhood movies, I don't I'm not sure, but I think they were on Tubi at one point. So I'm not sure they still well, are between, not. Um, between Paramount Plus and Showtime in the States, there's a ton of these Paramount movies that are coming out. And I've done like seven of them. So those are those are findable as well, like Crawl Space and Dangerous Games and some other ones. So if you just kind of look, you'll find a lot more stuff. Well, do you have any uh, social media accounts you want to plug or anything Yeah, like everything that? is me, Bradley Striker. <laughs> so just look up Bradley Striker and you'll find you, don't right? Do the, don't do the Twitter or TikTok. So it's mostly on Instagram. But yeah, you can find me just at my name, at Bradley Striker. It's easy. Uh, real quick, do you, uh, do you like enjoy doing you know, uh, social media stuff, or do you feel like you're more focused on, on doing stuff that's, you know, not focused on your phone? I, en I understand the enjoyment of social media. The problem is, is that it's tragically unhealthy for us. Um, and, you know, the minute I started to realize, you know, the surgeon, surgeon general of the United States just announced that it's a problem for teenagers, right? He gave a public health warning about it. Um, but last week and I was like see this is where I knew we were headed and I have a child and so what I know is the day he wants to sign up for Instagram he's essentially asking for me to take him to the local mini mart and buy him a carton of Marlboro Reds All right <laughs> the craziest part is it might be better for me to introduce him to smoking than social media <laughs> which is insane because the research is starting to lean that way so do I enjoy it? No, I understand how to, all of the fun things about it. Yes. And I love keeping up with people, but it's not my jam because um, I also think it's ruining a lot of people's lives. And therefore I, I lose the joy in it sometimes because I think a lot of what's on there is not real. Um, yeah. That's, un, that's, un, it's just the truth. Right. I yeah. mean, I, and that's, that, that's part of the, that's part of the, of you the, can lie on social media, you know, anytime you want. You know, it's, it's, creating, it's creating a world in which a lot of people feel inferior, and I find that to be uh, too, uh, too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure chatting with you and everything. And I think, uh, I think the audience got a lot out of this, you know, um, and uh, whatnot. Um, I'm going to finish the rest of the in Ohio tonight because <laughs> I was really yeah. into it. And I was like, damn it, I wish I had like done this earlier, but you know, sure, uh, sure. it's been a lot of in a lot of times so i i really really was into it um can't wait to see where your character ends up um you know and whatnot but um everybody else uh check that stuff out and uh check out all of uh bradley's social media that you might not post much on <laughs> yeah, yeah I post, it's funny because i post maybe once a week because i use them for business so you'll see stuff 
you'll see stuff, but only okay. the stuff he needs you to see, you know, part of that. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, join us in a couple months when we'll be back. Until then, everybody. Bye.